Good day. Rumours are rife as of last night and this morning that Ukraine might be on the eve of launching its much debated and discussed counteroffensive, principally lo principally focused upon the south of Ukraine. This despite the fact that according to Russian estimates, Ukraine has only re received around 20% of the tanks, which it was promised by the West. And of course, the number of tanks the West promised is also far short of the number of tanks that Ukraine itself said it needed in order to carry out a successful offensive, be it in the South or indeed anywhere else in Ukraine as well. But putting all that aside, and as of this moment in time, there's little actual concrete information about any Ukrainian counterattack. Fighting continues in other places. Now, yesterday I reported the fact that the uh, Russians, Yevgeny Prigozhin to be precise, was saying that the Russians had captured the Central Administration building in Bakhmut and raised their flag there, a flag which um, re referenced Vladlen Tatarsky, the Russian war reporter, who was murdered in St. Petersburg the other day. Well, we've now had conclusive confirmation of this. There's been photographs which show this building with the Russian flag on it. There's no doubt at all that it has been captured. They also show the building in a state of extreme ruins. It has clearly been heavily devastated by intense fighting and... Um, typical, by the way, of most of the situation of Bakhmut itself. But there's no doubt at all that the Russians are still largely, well, are, are now largely or fully in control of central, ba of central Bakhmut. In fact, I read a report earlier this today, which uh, from a Russian channel, which claimed that um, the Russians now control 85% of Bakhmut, and um, apparently they continue to make significant advances in the fighting in Bakhmut over the course of the last 24 hours. And this report went on to say that the um, Ukrainian resistance in Bakhmut, though it continues to be fierce, is starting to weaken that it is, in fact, Ukrainian defences which are starting to crumble rather than the Russians who are losing momentum, as some earlier reports in the West were suggesting. You want to find this report, whose origin I don't know. You can find it on the Slavian Slavyangrad Telegram channel, which, as well as being, in my opinion, um, one of the, the single most reliable place to find a detailed account of the fighting, also acts as a very effective site aggregator, bringing together reports from both sides of the conflict, Ukrainian as well, by the way. Um, whilst I'm on the topic of Slavyangrad, I noticed a rather interesting article by Andrew Roth in The Guardian, discussing um, the murder of Vladlen Tatarsky, mentioning that he belongs to an e ecosystem of, uh, or belonged to an ecosystem of various Russian military bloggers and telegram channels, uh, uh, conceding that these channels were, uh, in many cases, very critical of the Russian authorities, but perhaps inevitably rather casting doubt on their reliability. I have to say that these channels, both Russian and Ukrainian, in my opinion, despite what Andrew Roth says, are by far the most reliable source of the actual battle, of what's actually going on in these battles. You have to take always the openly expressed biases into account.
but they do have informants and reporters on the ground. Many of the people who are involved in preparing these channels um, also have um, military backgrounds themselves. And in any event, they're much closer to the events than reporters writing about fighting in Kiev or Moscow, let alone London, Washington, New York, Paris, Berlin, or wherever. And I think anybody who tries to understand what's going on in this war without referencing these people and reading what they say is going to get the fighting completely and profoundly wrong. They will not understand what is going on on any particular day or indeed over the course of the war as a whole. So that's just my view. Andrew Roth clearly has his, but I think it's just as well that I set out my own view on this particular issue because as you will have noticed I do rely on these telegram channels quite a lot when I discuss um, the state of the fighting um, in my programs. Anyway, regardless of that, clear evidence that the Russians are indeed making progress and we've in Bakhmut and we've also had some confirmation of this from Denis Pushilin, the um, um, head of the Donetsk regional government. He's given another interview on Russian television. He seems to be on Russian television practically every day. But anyway, he says, he says this. Um, um, Artyomov's direction, Artyomov, to reiterate again, is the Russian name for Bakhmut. Right now, Russian forces have almost come... All, come almost right next to the railway station. The enemy, he means the Ukrainians, is forced to retreat to the previously prepared positions in the western part of the city. And Pushilin is then reported to have said that the fighting is very intense uh, and is going on in downtown Artyomovsk, Bakhmut. And um, according to Pushilin, Russian forces are engaged in an almost constant offensive and have taken the roads leading into the city. These are the two roads that pass through Khormovo, slightly to the north, and Ivanivska, slightly to the south, under even tighter fire control. And in fact, there have also been reports that even as the Russians push the Ukrainians hard, in Bakhmut itself, they're continuing to apply pressure on Ukrainian forces that are defending themselves in these two villages. Now, I've discussed many times my difficulties reading maps, but I understand that the railway station is located firmly in the western part of Bakhmut. So if it is indeed the case that the Russians, that the Wagner forces, are close to the railway station, then it is highly likely that they are indeed advancing and at the pace, at the rate that Pushilin and others say, and that they do indeed control 85% of the town. I would say that I am confident, however, that the Ukrainians are still in control of the avant-garde stadium. Um, I understand that the Russians are very close to it. They've basically perhaps surrounded it, but the Ukrainians are still in control of the stadium itself, and that remains an important fortified position. Now, there's also <laughs> been some reports from Abdeyevka, and again we come to Denis Pushilin, talking in the same television interview, he says that in the Avdeyevka direction, our units are also moving forward. It is early to speak about operational encirclement. Yet, the situation emerging for the enemy is extremely difficult, if not critical. Here we see the need to blockade the road, which is being done quite successfully. And Pushirin went on to say that Russian troops are developing 
their offensive in the Avdiyevka area after what he referred to as the liberation of Krasnogorovka, this important village to the north of Avdeevka, which the Russians captured about two weeks ago. So that's what Pushilin says about the fighting in Avdeevka. Now, all of that, to some extent, as of today, continues, however, to be overshadowed by the rumours that this Ukrainian offensive is about to begin. I have to say that given the weather conditions, what I've heard about the weather conditions, I find that a little surprising, but who knows? Anyway, what is indisputable is that there's been a great deal of cross, well, shelling <laughs> across the battle lines in the south of Ukraine. The Russians seem to be launching particularly heavy artillery and airstrikes on Ukrainian forces gathered around Orekhov, which is this town in um, Zaporozhye region, which the Russians approached in January, but never seemed to have attempted to storm, and which they appear to believe is where the, which will form the anchor of the Ukrainian advance. I'm now coming round to the view, by the way, that the Russian advance in Zaporozhye region in January was not intended to be a general offensive. It was intended to bring Russian forces within striking distance of Orekhov in the, in the knowledge that this was going to be the main area of concentration of Ukrainian troops, and that has enabled the Russians to conduct artillery strikes on Ukrainian positions and all, uh, concentrations of Ukrainian troops in Orekhov, and to do them, according to the Russians, of course, with some success. Of course, what the Ukrainians themselves say about these artillery strikes, these Russian artillery strikes, well, that I don't know. I don't think, actually, that they discuss them very much. Anyway, um, another of our various commenta commenters, Vladimir Rogov, the head of the, uh, well, one of the officials of the Zaporozhye regional government set up by the Russians in the part of Zaporozhye region which they control, has now been discussing the situation with TASS, with the Russian TASS news agency. And this, he is doing this in connection with Ukrainian artillery strikes on Melitopol, and there's been a number of strikes on Melitopol, and also some sort of, you might call them sabotage or bomb attacks in Melitopol. Ukraine has inserted some um, infiltrators there. There was a bomb attack um, on the car of a regional official in Melitopol, Russian regional official, in Melitopol, he was severely injured, but apparently not yet killed. He's, at least he's still alive. Uh, anyway, there's been things like that going on. And I understand that most, in fact, all of the shelling of Melitopol, which is principally being conducted by HIMARS missiles, is taking place from the area of Orekhov. And this is how uh, Rogov talks about it. He says that attacks on Melitopol have intensified as Ukrainian forces are testing the ground for an offensive. And Rogov is quoted by TASS as saying that the Ukrainian military could launch a counterattack at any time, and it is the Zaporozhye front that will be the priority for them. And um, he has also apparently told TASS that he thinks that um, Ukraine might also try to launch waterborne attacks. That could be an attempt to try to cross the Dnieper River into Kherson region. There was a report yesterday, false as it turned out, that from Ukrainian sources that the Russians had abandoned their positions in a particular settlement on the east bank of the Dnieper River in Kherson region. Anyway, that could all be an attempt to play mind games with the Russians preparatory to some sort of uh, 
amphibious assault across the Dnieper into Kherson region, east, the eastern part of Kherson region, in conjunction with this offensive, um, which the Ukrainians are said to be planning um, in Zaporozhye region. Anyway, um, a lot of that, a lot of discussion, some shelling by both sides. I will say that there have been some high Mars missile strikes on Melitopol, but my impression is that they've been of relatively low intensity. There have not been many high Mars missiles, and the Russians seem to feel that they're able to um, intercept most of these high Mars missile strikes. Now, in a recent program, Brian Belletic at the U Atlas pointed out that the extent of Ukrainian high mass missile strikes appears to have declined markedly in re recent months, and which is true. And he also um, suggested that the probable reason that, well, one possible reason why that might be the case is that Ukraine has lost most of its high mass launchers. The Russians have been claiming at various times that they've tracked down and destroyed high Mars launchers. The US and Ukraine have generally denied that. They never admitted to the loss of a single launcher. In fact, I have no doubt that some of the launchers have indeed been destroyed. And it could be that the reason we're seeing fewer of these uh, missile strikes with high Mars missiles taking place is precisely because the Ukraine does indeed have fewer launchers for these missiles. I would say, however, that there is another possibility, which is that high, uh, Ukraine might be stockpiling high Mars missiles in advance of its offensive. And we might start to see a lot more of these missiles being used once the offensive does indeed get underway. I would say, however, something else about the high mass system. When it started to be used by Ukraine last summer, it was a system that the Russians had very little information about, advanced information about. Obviously, they knew of its existence. They had some general ideas of its general parameters. But that is not the same as having to confront and deal with the system in actual combat conditions. So the Russians, for a time, did have problems with the high mass missile system. Over the course of the last few months, the Russians, however, will have gained a great deal of information about the high mass system indeed. Now, this will have come partly from the capture of intact missiles, which has happened. I've actually seen pictures of intact HIMARS missiles in Russian possession, and the Russians have obviously examined these missiles and got a clearer idea of how they work and what they can do. So there's been some of that. But of course, the very act of having to conduct military operations in the face of HIMARS missile strikes is something which will have affected the way in which the Russians operate. And, of course, over the last 10 months or so, the Russians will have worked out countermeasures. And, in fact, they have indeed worked out quite a lot of countermeasures. Even Western commentators are talking about how the Russians have learned to disperse their depots and their barracks so that they're not so vulnerable to high mass strikes. And, of course, the Russians, as they said themselves, have updated the software of their air defence systems and are be be much better able to shoot down high mass missiles than they were back in the summer and autumn. So, yes, this remains an effective system, and the Ukrainians may have more of a punch than perhaps people realise with respect to this system 
but the Russians are better prepared for it, understand it better than they did back in the autumn when the previous Ukrainian offensive took place. So, just making that <laughs> general observation. Now, I don't know much about the various plans that are going on, which the two sides are making. When Shoigu visited the Russian headquarters in Rostov and Don a few days ago, um, the Russian Defence Ministry confirmed that the Russian military does indeed have a plan. So, you know, there are plans and we can see some of the things that the Russians are doing. They continue to build enormous fortifications across this entire region, in uh, Zaporozhye region, in Kherson region, in Crimea itself. Uh, long layers of defence lines, which are on a scale that we've not seen before in this conflict. I suspect they far go far beyond the scale, even of the fortifications that Ukraine created in Donbass, though, of course, I don't know that for a fact. Anyway, there's been an enormous amount of fortifying by the Russians since um, October, and undoubtedly the Russians have brought up their forces in southern U in, in this area, this battle area along the Black Sea up to strength, and they've been launching more, as I said, artillery strikes, and they also launched a very significant cruise and drone strike on Ukrainian positions in southern Ukraine yesterday, particularly, again, targeting the Odessa area. And uh, there's been some suggestions that a large proportion of, a larger proportion of Geranium-2 drones were able to reach their targets in Odessa than before. And there's some speculations on the Russian side that this is because the Ukrainian air defence system has now been depleted to the point where in order to provide effective air defence for Kiev itself, air defence assets across Ukraine, including in the Odessa area, have had to be transferred to bolster the air defences in Kiev. Now, I say that, that's of course a Russian claim that more of these drones are getting through, these Geranium-2 drones are getting through. Uh, the Ukrainians, on the contrary, claim that they were rather successful shooting down Geranium-2 drones in Odessa. What I will say about all of that is that it took a while for Ukraine to admit the missile and drone strikes on Odessa. There's apparently some delays in sounding the alarm that this strike was indeed underway. And again, that may imply that the drone strikes were indeed fairly successful in the sense that more drones did indeed penetrate, as the Russians claim. But let me repeat once more, I am not reporting the situation from the ground. It's not always easy to tell who's telling the truth, given the competing narratives. Um, I can only report what people say and inform you of my own judgments. Now, having said that, that does bring us to a number of commentaries that there have been about the state of the war in the Western media. There was a report in the New York Times um, about the fact that the Ukrainian army is becoming tired. There was a similar report in the Washington Post. Um, I'm not going to devote much time to those articles. There was also an article by Gideon Rackman in the Financial Times. Gideon Rackman, who is...
a strong supporter of Ukraine, has visited Ukraine, and specifically Kiev, and though he tries hard in this article to be optimistic, my overall impression was that he also felt that there's been a lowering of morale, a decline of morale in Ukraine, that people are tired and exhausted, and that there's a sense that altogether too much is now riding on this Ukrainian counteroffensive. In fact, Gideon Rackman actually says at one point that some Ukrainian officials are worried that if the offensive fails or doesn't achieve its objectives, um, people in the West should not jump to conclusions that Ukraine is indeed losing the war. And I find that an interesting comment because it sort of suggests that there is not very high optimism in Kiev about this offensive's prospects. But anyway, all of these articles, uh, to my mind, come together in a much more interesting article. In The Hill, The Hill is one of those US publications which cover uh, principally US domestic politics. It's closest British equivalent, it seems to me, is The Spectator. It's one of those magazines that, as I said, covers a lot of politics. The Hill, presumably, is Capitol Hill, but it also does talk about foreign policy quite a lot. And this article is by Earl Mack, who is a former US diplomat. He was ambassador to Finland, I understand, at one time. And he says this, and this article dates from the 29th of March, so it's just a few days old. As fatigue grows and morale wanes in Ukraine, defeat is a real possibility. And the article then goes on to say this, and I'm going to quote from it extensively. The Russian invasion of Ukraine recently passed the one-year mark, and I fear the country is on the verge of losing to Russia. As someone who has visited Ukraine multiple times on humanitarian missions, my last trip convinced me that the country is at a pivotal moment. Morale is slipping. I could see it in the eyes of the children. More importantly, I could hear it in the voice of their leaders, who continue to say all the right things, but lack the same conviction as before. The United States, NATO and our European allies have been propping up Ukraine to fight a proxy war. It's interesting, by the way, that he says that, that Ukraine is fighting a proxy war. <laughs> but anyway, I will move on. But the efforts amount to doing half a job. The failure of the United States and NATO to provide the necessary support, including modern military equipment, is a major issue. It seems the majority of the equipment being supplied to the Ukrainians came out of a Cold War era muse military museum. Ukrainian soldiers are fighting the Russians with leopard tanks, only a handful of which are modern, and Soviet era MiG fighters that are over 30 years old. By the time US Abrams tanks reach Ukraine in 8 to 10 months, as US officials have stated, the war could be, well be over. We need to send the Ukrainians modern fighting hardware yesterday. Where is the urgency? Now, I'm going to say a few things about this. Uh, first of all, as is fairly clear, Earl Mack is a supporter of Ukraine. He wants Ukraine to win. We're going to come to that further in the program, but he's talking about falling morale in Ukraine, including amongst Ukraine's own leaders. They no longer have 
the conviction in victory that they did previously. And this is connected to disappointment about the dwindling, the lack of advanced military equipment they're getting from the West. And note how Mac says that the Leopard tanks, of the Leopard tanks, only a handful of them are modern. And this clearly derives from the Ukrainian military's own assessment of these tanks. They've now received quite a few of these tanks, um, about 50 of them, I believe, in total. They come from various different sources. And, of course, the Leopard 2 tank has had an extensive construction history. And they come. these tanks come from different batches. And it seems that the Ukrainians have found that only a handful of these Leopard tanks, Leopard 2 tanks, are fully up to date. Now, I say Leopard 2 tanks because, as far as I'm aware, Ukraine has not yet received any of the much older Leopard 1 tanks that, as I said, date principally from the 1960s and 1970s. Um, so, already there is disappointment with the quality of the mill, uh, both with the quality and the quantity of the supplies of equipment that Ukraine has received from the West. And then Mac goes on to say, well, the U Russian invasion of Ukraine is just a year old. The nation has been in almost continual conflict since 2014. A fact, by the way, which the Russians also make, but which people in the West don't want to acknowledge. In fact, I can remember Boris Johnson before the fighting taking off in February last year, actually calling Ukraine a peaceful country, which, of course, it was not. It has not known peace since 2014. And Mac describes this as a case when Russian-backed separatist movements in the Donetsk and Lugansk regions of Ukraine declared independence and the Russian government annexed the Crimean Peninsula. And then he goes on to say, as the Ukrainians approach a decade of death and chaos, President Putin knows that the Russians will win a war of attrition. It's a point that has been made by Brian Belletic, by Scott Ritter, by Douglas McGregor, time and again. And here we have a senior US diplomat who knows Ukraine well. He's just been to Ukraine. He's had meetings with Ukrainian leaders. And they are admitting to him that Ukraine is in a war of attrition and that they know that they are losing, that this is a war of attrition that Russia is winning and knows that it is winning. And then Mac goes on to say this, Ukrainian cities are systematically being pounded into rubble. Critical infrastructure totally destroyed or rendered inoperable. Over 10 million Ukrainians have crossed the border or fled their country. The loss of population, death and destruction has left the people, especially its children, emotionally devastated. Time is one commodity the Ukrainians don't have. Ukraine isn't just losing its present and past, it is losing its future too. In a war that has often seen Ukrainian parents sent off to battle, it is children that are left vulnerable. According to the United States Embassy in Italy, about 25% of Ukrainian armed forces are female, 60,000 in regular positions, 5,000 on the front lines. And then he talks about how Putin has exploited this dire situation by deporting more than 10,000 ch Ukrainian children back to Russia. Well, that's Mac's view. <laughs> I'm not going to explore that. And he talks about um, 
Putin's war crimes and compares those to the Nazis in the Second World War, which I don't accept at all. But anyway, he, de he goes on to say that the situation is not only a tragedy for the children and their families, but also for Ukraine's future. Children are the future of any country, and Ukraine is losing a significant part of its future. Who will build, rebuild Ukraine after the war is over? And about that, by the way, I am in complete agreement. But then, of course, we find ourselves in the absurd situation. Uh, rather, the absurd analysis, at least I find it absurd. I don't find it just absurd. I find it wrong. Because you would have thought that Mr. Mack, assessing all of these things, would conclude that what Ukraine most needs is peace, not more war, and that the way to do that is to achieve some kind of diplomatic political settlement in Ukraine. But um, instead of that, he does exactly what all of those participants in that meeting discussed by Spengler in Asia Times, which I discussed about a week ago. And by the way, um, several people have written to me informing me of who Spengler is. He's a gentleman, a Mr. Goldman, a former banker and a well-known personality in the United States. Somebody who is, in all respects, the kind of person you would expect to attend these kind of meetings. And I accept that he's no longer keeping his um, identity secret even though he does still like to use the name Spengler for his articles in Asia Times. But anyway, putting that aside, anyway, Spengler described, discussed or described a situation, a, a situation where, in spite of the recognition that Ukraine is losing the war and that the United States might have no means of turning things round, he described a situation in which the only response of US officials was to try to find ways to escalate and double down. And um, so he dismisses any possibility of the Chinese fulfilling any kind of mediation role. He says China's Intervention in the conflict in any form will help buoy Russian resolve and rearm. And um, he says that whilst our efforts to arm the Ukrainians are taking the slow boat to China, Xi Jinping has taken a rocket ship to Russia. How I detest this kind of clever verbal gymnastics. What does that even mean, actually? I mean, it's not as if the United States hasn't provided tens of billions of dollars of military equipment to Ukraine. But anyway, and, you know, what has China done in response to that? But anyway, so don't negotiate and even think about negotiating. Provide Ukraine with more arms and do it immediately. Do it as a matter of urgency so that Ukraine's counteroffensive this counteroffensive I was talking about at the start of this program, this counteroffensive, which for all we know might be about to start, it might have already started by the time you're watching this program, <laughs> so that this counteroffensive can succeed. There is a ray of hope. Ukraine has been preparing a counteroffensive that could change the course of the war and lay the groundwork for a settlement. After the prolonged battle of Bakhmut, Russian forces were considerably weakened. Where's the evidence of this? I'm not going to discuss this anymore. It's become now a mantra amongst those people who want to see the war continue, that 
Russia has suffered more losses in, in Bakhmut than Ukraine has done. And then he goes on to say, as a result, there is a possibility of launching an offensive now before the Russians have the ability to mobilize again. But this will be difficult. The Russians are well dug in and have, an ample, and have had ample time to prepare for a potential Ukrainian offensive. Committed to a war of attrition. Interesting how Mr. Mack finally acknowledges what Douglas MacGregor, Scott Ritter, Brian Baletic have been saying for months, going all the way back to the summer, that the Russians are fighting an attritional war in Ukraine and are winning it in consequence. But anyway, committed to a war of attrition, Putin has demonstrated a willingness to put, sacrifice both troops and military hardware. Again, what's the evidence of that? As uh, both Scott Ritter, Brian Baletic and Douglas McGregor have all said, on the contrary, Russian approach has been one of economy of force, of avoiding losses whilst inflicting maximum losses on Ukraine. But again, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to discuss this in further detail now. Committee to a war of attrition, Ukraine must identify and exploit Russian vulnerabilities and act decisively for this battle to succeed. Ukraine needs everything, everywhere, all at once. The United States and its allies need to send the Ukrainian military more modern, modern equipment, including more Patriot missiles and many more Leopard 2 and Abrams tanks, and do it today. Do it today. It's so simple. All you do is send hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands tanks, Leopard suit tanks, Abrams tanks, of course, don't worry about where they come from, how, whether, you know, stocks of these weapons exist. I mean, you just send them, send them everything you've got. And um, not just tanks, obviously, but Patriot missiles. There's a shortage, a general shortage of Patriot missile systems. This is widely acknowledged, but, well, you know, those kind of considerations don't really apply. We are going to send... We should send, well, not just one battery or two batteries or three batteries of Patriot missiles. We should send many, many more. Five, 10, 15, 20. Well, it was, in fact, Zelensky who said that Ukraine <laughs> needs 20. And then he goes on to say, this is what Mr. Max says, the fall of Ukraine would vote ominously for the future of Europe and the United States. We need to send a message to the Russians and the Chinese that the civilized world will not back away from this existential challenge. Now, just take a step back and think of what he's just said. Earlier, he admitted that the war in Ukraine, one whose appalling effects he is describing with total accuracy, the the tragedy this country has suffered, the thousands of people killed, the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people killed, the orphaned children, the uh, um, devastated cities, the collapsing economy, the women pressed into the military to make up the numbers. And all of this is happening in the context of what he himself calls a proxy war. And why is this proxy war being fought? Well, I'm going to suggest that, without meaning to, he's given away the purpose. He says that the United States needs to send a message to the Russians and the Chinese that the civilised world... The civilised world? What is the civilized world? India? It's neutral. Africa? It's also neutral. Latin America? Neutral too. Most of the Asian states? Neutral as well. Many of these countries are sympathetic to Russia, in fact, in this conflict. The civilized world, 
the United States, in other words, and Europe, that the civilized world will not back away from this existential challenge. Now, just think of that. It's all about sending the West, which Mr. Mack effectively says, because conflating with the civilized world, it's all about sending a message. All this death, misery, destruction, it's all about sending a message to the Russians and the Chinese. And in order to make it all completely clear, he says this is not only about Ukraine, but it is also about the future of democracy around the world. If Russia is allowed to turn Ukraine into a proxy state, it will embolden sea to do the same with Taiwan. This is unacceptable, and it is up to the international community to take a stand. The world, and especially Europe, has lived through the horror of appeasement and must awaken to what is at stake in Ukraine. The time to act is now, and we must act decisively to prevent Ukraine from falling to Russia. Now, I'm going to say straight away that the things that Mr. Mack says are so close, so identical, in effect, with what was said at that uh, meeting described by Spengler for Asia Times, that I wonder, I mean, I don't know, but I wonder whether Mr. Mack might have been one of the participants in that meeting. But just, just take a step back and think about this. This is not a war about Ukraine. It's a war about something completely different, about sending a message to the Chinese and the Russians. And it's a war which is about something called the future of democracy around the world. Notice that Mr. Mack has already used that word, the civilized world. Again, an expression I find troubling, to put it mildly. He's effectively conflating that with the West. He might not intend it so, but if you think about it, that is what he means. He then talks about the international community, as if it was the same thing as this civilized world that he's talking about. And he makes it a little clearer when he says that the world, especially Europe, has lived through the horror of appeasement and must awaken to what is at stake in Ukraine. Horror of appeasement, again, conjuring once more memories of what happened in Europe in the 1930s and 1940s. So, to be totally frank, I think that this is an analogy that is so wrong at so, level, so many levels that, you know, it just leaves me astonished to think about it in that way. I mean, <laughs> let me just say one, two quick Make two quick points. Firstly, this war has happened, ultimately, in my opinion, for two reasons. The first is because NATO would not cease expanding. In fact, it's expanding again today. It's about to incorporate Finland, to take over Finland. Finland, which has been a neutral country, which no one has threatened, which prospered for many decades, as a result of its very good, stable relationship with Russia, Finland, without any proper debate inside Finland, without a referendum or anything like that, is now, as of today, once more a member of NATO. So yeah, expansion of NATO done in clear violation of promises given to the Soviet and Russian leaders at the end of the 19, uh, at the end of the Cold War and in the years which immediately followed. So that's one reason. And the other reason is because 
Ukraine refused to grant even limited autonomy to Donbass, despite the fact that it was required to do so by the Minsk Agreement, which it itself signed. Instead of granting that autonomy, instead of negotiating with the leaders of the Donbass, as it was required to do by the Minsk Agreement, it repeatedly attempted instead to assert its authority in Donbass by force. Now, the Minsk Agreement does not, in fact, make any requirements of Ukraine beyond that. It did not require Ukraine to change its foreign policy orientation. It did not require Ukraine to carry out any fundamental changes to its economic policies or anything of that kind. It required Ukraine to grant autonomy to Donbass, agree the terms of a new constitution, which would enshrine that autonomy in constitutional law, and then hold elections internationally supervised elections to form a new government. That was all it did. But of course, Ukraine refused to comply with the Minsk Agreement and the United States insisted on the, and the Western powers insisted on their right, even duty, to go on expanding NATO forever. And the fact that other countries, like Russia, oppose this, the fact that this provoked or precipitated a crisis within Ukraine, specifically within Ukraine itself, that, according to Mr. Mack, has no bearing at all on the situation we find ourselves in now. Now, I have to say, I consider all of this really appalling thinking. Let me say it again. I don't think this is a war. This is a, the, the issue of appeasement has any bearing to this, in this. People who constantly bring up this topic of appeasement are in effect making all negotiations of any kind all but impossible. The only negotiations which they seem willing to countenance in any particular conflict are negotiations which end in victory for the side that they are backing. And that's not a negotiation at all. That's not any kind of route to a diplomatic settlement. It is a route to a war. Nor do I think that the future of democracy is threatened by what is happening in Ukraine. On the contrary, democracy is being threatened in the West by things which are happening in the West, which I'm going to come to shortly. But there, of course, we come to the key point, because when Mr. Mack and people like him talk about the future of democracy around the world, it's not difficult to see what he means. After all, it's he who's talked about the civilized world, it's talked, he who's talked about Europe, it's he who's floated again the spectre of appeasement. What he means by democracy? is the perpetuation of the liberal hegemony of the United States and its friends. I say liberal hegemony. The word liberal should be in quotation marks because to be very clear, classical liberals of the 19th century and later would have found nothing very liberal about it. Well, there we go. Mr. Mack understands that Ukraine is losing the war. He understands the tragedy this is causing 
to Ukraine. But he doesn't look for a way out through diplomacy, through peace negotiations. His solution is more war, war to be fought with vast supplies of weapons provided to Ukraine today. Don't worry where they come from. Don't worry about depleted stocks of these weapons. Don't worry about logistical issues. Don't worry about training. Don't worry about organising forces. Don't worry about any of these things. Just provide the tanks, the machines, the Patriot missiles, all of those things in vast, extraordinary numbers. Again, I mean, magical thinking, if ever there was any. And do all of this, fight this war in order to send a message to Moscow and Beijing. A message which in some way, not made entirely clear, is intended to secure the perpetuation, the prolongation of Western power, which is, of course, referred to instead as the future of democracy around the world. I have a feeling that if I were ever to meet Mr. Mack, I would probably like him. Unlike many neocons, he does seem to have a genuine feeling for the tragedy of war. He talks about the women who've been called up. He talks about the devastation of Ukrainian cities. He talks about the pain of the children. All of that I can completely share. But the tragedy, his tragedy, the tragedy of so many people, is that they seem to be locked into this vision which they seem unable to break free from, but which traps the West, Ukraine, the Ukrainian people into this war, which he all but effectively admits Ukraine is going to lose. I don't think I have read a more depressing article about the conflict in Ukraine than this one. Anyway, let me now finish with a few further uh, general comments about the state of things around the world. John Helmer, Dancing with Bears, has written an exceptionally fine article um, about the coroner's inquest in Leicester into the deaths of uh, certain British passengers on the uh, Malaysian airliner that was shot down over Ukraine in 2014. And he rightly highlights the extraordinary way in which this inquest was conducted, at least my understanding of how an inquest ought to be conducted, does not in any way correspond with what happened. And I think that Helmer brings this out very, very well. And he also points out that this is now forming part of a pattern. And it certainly is. And it's a pattern which I find quite extraordinarily depressing. Now, going back to Mr. Mack and his article, he talks about the future of democracy. And I said that the future of democracy is not being threatened by what the Russians are doing in Ukraine. They're not the only people involved in this conflict in Ukraine. That point needs to be made clear. The future of democracy, at least in the West, is threatened by things which we are increasingly doing to ourselves. And I have to say this, that the collapse of due process, or rather the failure of due process, in much of the West is now becoming, for me, a matter that is causing me acute depression. Well, I've discussed many times the events in London connected to the case 
that's been brought against the against the Julian Assange. Helmer has talked about the the, the conduct of this inquest. There's also the extraordinary the extraordinary legal games underway in New York connected with this indictment of Donald Trump. Now, I've had a number of people writing to me very helpful pieces about the statute of limitations point when I talked about the indictment of Donald Trump and pointed out that the charges which were being brought against Donald Trump appeared to go against the statute of limitations. Now, what people have been doing is that they've been sending me the federal statute about violations of electoral expenses law. But I think I would just make the observation here and I do this with some humility because I don't pretend to be an expert in the in this area of the law. But as I understand it, Donald Trump is not being charged under that federal statute. That is a federal statute which is administered by the federal courts of the United States. The case that is being brought against Donald Trump is a fraud case. It relates to, apparently, fraudulent changes in company records. And it is being made according to the laws of the state of New York. And it is those laws which say that this sort of case is statute barred. In other words, it's time limited. That is my understanding of the position, and I just wanted to clarify that. But, all right, courts can, from time to time, if they're minded to, extend limitation periods. I've seen it done many times. I'm not convinced that this is that kind of a case, but never mind. The point is, just consider what kind of a case this is. It's a case which attempts to take an issue of election financing, which is a federal matter, and it's trying to prosecute it by constructing a case around the doctoring of company records. has already, to my mind, deeply controversial. In fact, I would say straightforwardly that I don't think a prosecuting attorney should be doing that kind of thing. If the federal agencies are not prepared to bring a prosecution under for breach of the overriding statute on electoral expenses, I don't think it's the job of courts of prosecutors in a state like New York to try to reproduce the same effect by manipulating other felonies intended straightforwardly for other purposes. But it goes much beyond that because I understand that the indictment charges Trump with 34 individual crimes. Now, that is ridiculous. And that already should be act as a major warning that this is not a real good faith prosecution, at least not one in my eyes. Because 34 felonies, 34 separate counts in an indictment is clearly ludicrously over the top. It's intended, and it's an extraordinarily shabby device, much frowned upon, as I know. It's, in, it's intended to present a jury 
with a vast menu of um, offences, of charges, um, and basically offer them, well, you know, if you don't think he committed this one, well, I've got another little one that you might convict him on. It's something that should never be uh, permitted. Charges should be meaningful and proper. And the very fact that this is done in that kind of way, to my mind, already confirms that this is a case of prosecutorial abuse. How could it happen? Once upon a time, I would have thought it inconceivable. Once upon a time, I would have said that Donald Trump being charged in this way would be confident of being able to walk free from the court because it is inconceivable that any court properly constituted could convict him. After all, even journals like The Economist in Britain, which is unsympathetic to Donald Trump, to put it mildly, have cast doubt on this case. Unfortunately, and this is where this is what brings me back to that coroner's inquest in Leicester, I am very far from confident any longer that this is the case. Because in case after case that I've seen, I've seen cases succeed which have been brought, as far as I can see, on blatantly political, partisan grounds, and which, once upon a time, would have been thrown out of court, but which are conducted and pursued and results, result in convictions. Because, and I get to say it, straightforward political biases. The case of Michael Flynn and what happened to him even after the Justice Department itself asked for the case against him to be dismissed and, his, and the judgment that had been entered against him to be overturned. The case of Michael Flynn is just one case amongst several. Now, once upon a time, I would have considered this impossible. And again, I'm not here... I don't have any brief for Donald Trump. I don't say that Donald Trump is spotlessly clean. He clearly isn't. I don't believe his story, for example, about his relations with Stormy Daniels. Just, 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 just to make that observation. But the point is not whether St Donald Trump is a good person or not. It is whether or not the law is being impartially applied and it seems to me that it isn't and that there is no certainty any longer that because this case has no merit it will necessarily fail and that is a terrible situation to be in now i'm just going to finish with something taken from fiction and that is that in germany over the last couple of years they've been broadcasting a drama series about events in Berlin in the late 1920s and 1930s. It's extremely well produced and it shows the state of events in Berlin. It's called Babylon Berlin and it focuses a great deal on the actions of the police force in Berlin during that period. And one of the secondary characters that's appeared is a man called Hans Litten. Now, Hans Litten was a real person. He was, an, he was a lawyer practicing in Berlin in the 1920s and 1930s. He was a rather edgier and more abrasive character than he appears in that particular film, uh, that particular series. And I noticed the series rather understates. He's rather strong political views, left-wing political views, which brought him very close to the German Communist Party of that period. But anyway, notwithstanding, he was an outstanding lawyer, and he did conduct a series of very brilliant defences of people, 
at that time. He was a brilliant criminal defence lawyer. And he's also famous because he subpoenaed as a witness in one of his cases a certain moustachioed gentleman from Austria who eventually became Germany's chancellor with catastrophic consequences for Germany and Europe. And he subjected this man, Lytton did, to relentless cross-examination, which that particular individual never forgot and never forgave with dire consequences for Lytton in the end. But anyway, I'm not going to talk about Lytton more. There is an extraordinary scene in this series where Lytton is sitting in a courtroom. He's trying to defend some journalists. And what he discovers suddenly is that everything has changed. The judge is no longer interested in hearing evidence. He, in fact, refuses to hear any defence evidence at all. He refuses to hear any defence submissions at all. He receives a note from the prosecutor, which he reads, but won't share with Lytton. He then immediately goes, and after a hearing that lasts perhaps 10 minutes, he goes forward and simply, find, simply orders conviction of the defendants who've not been provided with any opportunity to defend themselves, either through Lytton or on their own count. And then after further consideration, he meets out a harsh prison sentence. And Lytton is sitting in the courtroom and he's absolutely dazed. He's astonished by what has happened. He can't believe it. He's been brought up all his life functioning within a legal system, a functioning legal system, and he sees it collapse in the courtroom where he is sitting. And what makes it even more surreal for Lytton, this is, as I said, the fictional Lytton, not the real one, is that even as that happens, everything else, life, or so it seems, carries on as normal. Nobody seems unduly concerned except the defendants and himself about what has happened. The rest of the judicial system seems to function much as it did. As I said, life in general goes on as always, and most people neither know nor care. Except, of course, that as we know, Things did, things like that did start to happen in Germany in the early 30s. And then they continued to get worse. And then the moustachioed gentleman took over. And, well, we all know the consequences of that. <coughs> I have to say <coughs> that... <coughs> Watching, listening to these events, reading articles like Helmer's, I do sometimes feel a little bit like Lytton did in that programme. <coughs> anyway, that's all I'm going to say for this programme today. Um, I hope that the outcome for us is not as bad as it was in the Germans in the 30s. But all of this fills me with deep disquiet and gives me a great sense of foreboding for the future. That's my programme for the today. Um, I will end it there. I will say that obviously I'll be back with any more news of Ukrainian counteroffensives or those sort of things. We'll see also what happens in Bakhmut over the next couple of hours. And in the meantime, all that remains is for me to wish you a very good day to remind you that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin and Telegram. You can also um, support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. You can also go to our shop, buy the amazing things that you will find there. 
our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, and all those things. And last but not least, if you have liked this video, please remember to take the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon.